Pastor Luke is our high school pastor, and uh, I, I found out this morning you're the, the coolest looking pastor on staff. Yes. You're the most handsome. That's what they um, say. Most, well, at least I heard one person say that. Probably wasn't he even my a, wife. He looked a lot like you. <laughs> <laughs> Will you give Pastor Luke a, a warm welcome tonight as he brings the word to us? Thanks, Pastor Jeff. Man, I'm super honored to be here and sharing with you. What an amazing night that we get to cover new life in Jesus. The old has gone, the new has come. And then we get to celebrate and pour into and invest in amazing families that are going across the globe to to spread the gospel of Jesus so more people can be transformed by the gospel. The old has gone, the new has come. Man, I love nights like these. I just think we should just open the altars and be done. You don't even need to hear from me. Like, man, that's so amazing what God is doing. And I'm just constantly reminded, even in high school ministry, that it just, it just takes one moment with Jesus to change everything. It just takes one moment. And that's why I love hearing the stories and seeing the face of these missionaries and investing in them. Because, man, it takes one moment. It just takes one moment with Jesus. But it takes someone to share that moment with them, with these people who have no idea. And so we're so thankful um, that we can be a church that is, is, is investing and sending and giving. Um, but tonight I'm, I'm picking up after last week we were talking on tough questions. Uh, tough questions about all sort of different topics on Christianity and faith. And tonight I'm talking about the question of unanswered prayers. Or if God is silent, you could say is one of my messages uh, or the title of my message uh, tonight. So why don't we just start off in prayer. Jesus, I just thank you that you're here. We thank you for new life in you. And that you don't just come to make us better. You come to give us life and life abundant. And we thank you for that, Jesus. I pray that you would, would speak to us. Our, our hearts and our minds uh, are open to what you have. Would you move and we praise you. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Uh, well, honestly, this, this topic is, is something that I feel like is relevant to everyone in every season. I think there is, um, there is no, um, I don't think, if you think about prayer, I think, and th there's no statistic on this or anything, and this is my belief that everybody prays. I think everybody prays. I think atheists pray. I think all sorts of people pray. Have you ever been on an airplane and you hit some turbulence? Or that airplane goes into a 100-foot free fall? I don't care if you're atheist. I don't care what you are. You're praying to someone and you're praying to something, right? The, everybody prays at some point. And so I think that's why this topic is so relevant. And because prayer is supposed to be fundamental of who we are as Christians. Prayer is supposed to be not just requests, but an intimate conversation that grows and grows us deeper with our Heavenly Father, just the access that we have. But there's certain times where there's needs that we may have, there's requests shot up to heaven, and it feels like it falls on deaf ears. It feels like a God is distant, and He's silent, and He's not there. I know in my own personal life as, as a kid, praying earnestly for my Grammy, who was a saint of all saints, she started a prison ministry, she taught herself Spanish to minister to the men and women, uh, the Latinos in prison, taught herself how to play guitar because they needed some worship. She was a saint, and she passed away when I was young from cancer. I remember praying every night for her as a young boy, uh, praying with my mom, and being con even confused as a, as a little boy, as eight, eight or nine years old, of why, but I thought God loved us, I thought God loved her. And then fast forward a couple years later and my, my own mom gets cancer and praying earnestly, most of the time probably just out of fear that the same fate awaits my mom. Uh, now God miraculously, this, if you want to know the story, I don't have time to share it tonight, but God moved mightily, miraculously and healed my mom and she's been cancer free for like 15 or 16 years. So praise God. But I sit here still with the tension of going, well, me as almost 28 years old, 20 years later, having my grandma died and my mom lived, why did he say yes to one and say no to the other? I have no idea. I, I sit here 20 years later going, I, I, it's, I'm not even at the place where I can say, yeah, I've seen the full circle of why he took my grandma or why she passed away. I, I, I haven't seen a, 
a full purpose unfold yet in that. I haven't maybe been answered some of those why questions that I proposed to Jesus as a little boy. There's no full circle moment that has happened yet with that. There's no final puzzle piece that fits and now I'm outside of it. And it causes us to question why. I know there's times and circumstances in your own life or someone you may know feeling the same exact way, asking this why, God, if you truly loved me, if you truly had the power to, if you were truly faithful, Lord, it says, you, you, out of your son's own mouth in scripture, it says, pray, uh, ask anything in my name and it shall be done, but God, I'm praying these things in your name and it didn't happen. And why? And, and, and I think it's a tough thing for us to wrestle with this question of why because when we get into those questions, it, it, I th I've seen in my own life and I've seen in other people's lives, we, we are often tempted to fall into this list of responses when we don't get an answer or it's, it's not answered how we want it to be answered or we just feel like God's not even listening. There's a couple of things that we tend to do. At first, we isolate ourselves from friends, from community, and most importantly, the body of Christ. We isolate ourselves. Satan loves to do that in us. We slowly kind of push back and push away because maybe we're self-conscious about continually saying it's not done yet, they haven't been healed yet, it hasn't been provided yet, and maybe we're just embarrassed, or I don't know the reason, but we tend to pull away, and then after that, Satan really does his work, and we then question the Father's love. We say, man, if God really loved me, why, why? I mean, this isn't a selfish prayer request, I'm praying for the healing of another person. I'm praying for X, Y, and Z, not for myself. And we start to question him as a loving father and that father's love for us. That moves to doubting his power. Well, yeah, maybe he loves me, but why isn't he working? Does he even do miracles today? Is that stuff of the Bible just metaphor for his faithful, faithfulness? Did it actually happen? Can he actually do it in my life? Is that thing, is that disease too great, too powerful? And after that, we move into a place where just we, re we reject his existence as a whole. I've seen this route taken by many, many of students going through hard things, going back into tough situations. And I can say I've walked down that road. I've been down that road myself. I think one of the challenging things with unanswered prayer, and I could talk with you this morning for hours. We could bring up the topics of God's sovereignty. We could bring up the topics of sin entered the world and it broke all of the systems that God had placed that were supposed to be good and perfect in every way. And now everything from nature, from people, from you know, anything, his systems are now broken. We could talk through that all day. We could talk about just the sovereignty of God. We could talk about all these things. And, and, and I think all those things are good to a point, but at the end, even talking through those, it doesn't maybe change how we feel on the inside. It maybe will tickle our minds a little bit, maybe give us a confidence in our brains, but not really our hearts. Our hearts are still hurting. We're still hurting in these situations. And so I wanted to not maybe go down those roads, but talk a little bit more specifically of what to do in answered prayer, what to do when we feel like God is silent. And we live in an age where um, we are entitled to all sorts of knowledge. At any point in time, I have access to infinite amounts of knowledge, information, and all, I don't even have to touch anything. All I have to do is say, hey Siri, uh-huh, I'm here, what do you need? Alexa, answer me. Hey, Google, even for the most random things, I can have information instantly. And then we become, because I have this, Siri's still talking to me, be quiet, you're not preaching, I am. And we ask a question and we immediately get a response. And we get seven different articles on that response and I get seven different viewpoints on that you know I like I have just an infinite wealth of knowledge and information at the tip of my finger and I think that's why it's so hard with God because we ask him a question and we feel entitled to a response at least we feel entitled to an answer we feel entitled to the knowledge I sh God I should know I should God you don't if you really love me I should be in the loop of what's going on 
At least do me a favor, God. At least show me, give me, give me a glimpse of 10 years down the road, 15, 20. God, at least give me a little glimpse. And when that isn't answered because we've been trained in the society to be entitled to information, we think it's a negative, hurtful, painful, abusive thing that God's doing to us. We don't always get the answer. We don't always understand, and it seems like God is silent. We feel like God, we deserve an answer. We feel like he's shielding things from us. Well, he knows everything, but he's just keeping it from me. We feel like we should know the reason behind X, Y, and Z happening or why a prayer isn't answered or answered the way we want it to, the purpose behind it. But a harsh reality for us this morning, I mean this afternoon, is that we aren't entitled to every answer. We're not entitled to the knowledge that God possesses. We're not. If we were, we would be creator and not created. We're not entitled to that. We are not God at the sense of I snap my fingers and I get the response. And that's sometimes hard to hear or sometimes chew on. But there is times in our lives where the why of what's going on will never get answered. It just won't. And there's a tension we have to wrestle with as Christians that, you know what, it, it, it may not even get answered in 10 years, 20 years, it may not even get answered in my lifetime. I may get an answer when I get to heaven. I, I may get the response, the full picture, the final puzzle piece, the why answered when I get to heaven. And that is a harsh and tough reality, this tension of, but, but we're God's children, I I'm entitled to know. I should be in the know. But if we truly believe that God is amazing, powerful, and, and, and majestic, and big, and wiser, and greater, if I could fully understand everything about God, he wouldn't be God. He would be limited to the 10% of my brain that I actually use. That's not God. So for me saying, God, you are all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving, and ever-present. If, if I'm claiming that as God is my creator, and I am just lower than him, then I have to be okay with, I might not ever get an answer to my question. I might not. And I'm okay with that. And I'll tell you why. In Isaiah 55, 8, it says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Just for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God is saying and yelling sometimes, I think, that he is greater. He is greater and I have to be okay with that. Some of the things, even if he answered in certain ways, he is so great, I think some of his responses, it would go over my head anyways. Because he is so amazing. Think of the intricacy of the details of his plan for every single human being on the planet for every detailed moment of their life. I think a response to my question may even go above my own knowledge. Scripture says, lean not on my own understanding. So if I got an answer and I gained wisdom or knowledge, I would argue that it wouldn't help me all that much when I'm going through something hard. God doesn't owe me an explanation, and we, as the church, we as Christians, myself included, I need to stop trying to fit God in my finite understanding of the world, my finite perspective, my small view, and we, I have to be okay with that. I have to be okay that he is God, and I am not. A couple things as I wrap up, and the worship team's going to come up, and we're just going to have an opportunity to be in God's presence and to pray and seek after his face. But there's a couple of things of how to deal with this silence, how to deal with these unanswered prayers. First thing is when I can't see his hand, I need to trust his heart. When I cannot see his hand working in my situation, for my prayer request, for my desires, my dreams, I need to trust his heart. Did you know that there's over 3,000 promises in the Bible from God for you and for me? Promises. Good promises. 
One of the biggest themes of these promises that we can see is that God is with us. God is with us. That's that's such an amazing promise. In fact, it's so powerful of a promise that, that it's not just something that God does, it's who he is. Emmanuel means God with us. It's a name of God. It's in his nature. He's with us, the God of the universe that I don't always understand, that I can't control, that is greater than me, is with me at all times. Well, God isn't responding. I can't hear him. I can't feel him. I can't see him working. My situation is the same. This is the same. The the cancer is still there. In those moments, do I have the courage to say God is with me and that is sufficient for me? If he decides no or not yet, is, is the fact that he's with me sufficient for me? It is. It should be. We just have to choose it. We just have to say, God, you know what? I trust that your heart for me is so good. These promises in the written word of God. I think, I think we can sometimes think, uh, you know, God is silent. Maybe he's just, you know, he's being silent. God is never silent. He may be silent in here and in here, but he's never silent. Why? Because he wrote a whole book of promises and the story for the salvation of his people and then to the ends of the earth for you and me. So whenever I get in a moment where I'm like, I'm not just, I, I just can't feel him, I can't, I, can't, I can't hear what he's saying, God, why don't you answer me? Why can't I see you know, a big thunderous light? Why can't you send an angel like Mary? He goes, hey, I wrote it down for you. You have it always. And when I start to go in that book and I start to read these promises, I can see his heart unfolding before me and start trusting, oh my goodness, his heart for me is so amazing. Psalm 46, one through three, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we won't fear. Though the earth give way, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, the mountains quake with their surging. Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears the cries and saves them. Hebrews 4, 16, for we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is in every respect been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. To help in time with need, in our need. He loves us. His plan for us is so amazing. The fact that that he sent his only son to die on a cross is hard to fathom when you really think about it. A deity would die for his creation, would die for the enemy which is you and me. God's heart for us is so amazing that I shouldn't always be looking for his hand moving. I can trust his heart, that he is faithful. That's why it says we walk by faith and not by sight. I may not be able to see all the time, but I can know his heart is for me. The second and last thing is to never stop praying. This is a hard one, especially when we're talking about unanswered prayers. So we, we, we do these requests and we, we do it even biblically and stuff doesn't happen the way we want it to or doesn't happen at all. And we di- get discouraged and then we stop praying. We stop getting in the presence of God. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything, instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you'll experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. Once again, greater than my mind. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you lived in Christ Jesus. I love it that this verse doesn't say, pray and God answers and then you'll get peace from him and then you can thank him. That's what we think we should do. I pray, he responds, then I, I get peace because I've seen him respond, then I can thank him when, when he's cashed the check or you know, when he's written the check to me. That's not what it says. It says, I pray and I thank God even for what he has done. Then I experience his peace. It doesn't say he responds and then I get peace. I get peace because I pray and I thank him. See, this, the response of God will not give you the peace that the presence of God will give you. 
His answer to your request, his answering of that puzzle piece, that why, won't give you the same peace that Jesus will. And that's why he says, stick with it. Even though praying is hard right now, get into my presence. Continue to pray to me. Continue to commune with me, to talk with me. I'm here. I'm with you. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. I got peace for you. Isaiah 54, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. All these things can happen. My unfailing love won't be shaken, nor my covenant of peace. Would you stand with me all across this place? In Isaiah 40, it's a verse that we love to quote or be quoted at when we're going through something tough. It says, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings Like eagles, they will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Like I said, this gets quoted at us a lot of times when we're struggling. And it may not mean a lot unless you really break down what it's actually saying. The Hebrew word for wait at the beginning, those who wait on the Lord. The Hebrew word there is, I'll probably botch this, quava. And it literally means, it's got a figurative meaning and a literal meaning. The literal translation of that word is to wrap oneself up by twisting. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That I can choose to wait on my circumstances to move. I can choose to wait on what's going on around me. And it starts to entangle me. It starts to wrap me up. And that's when I get anxious, I get angry, and I get confused. And I wrap myself up in worry and trouble. But God is saying, no, no, no. Wrap yourself up in my presence. Wrap yourself, entangle me. Not just around you, but in you. And my peace will be with you. You're going to gain strength if you wrap up in me. Not you're going to gain an answer or a response. You will gain strength if you wrap yourself in me. Would you close your eyes all across this place? Before we go into... I love this song, Waymaker. Even the bridge says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. And we're just going to open up the altars, open up a time for prayer if you need prayer. But if you're in this place and you would say, I have a need and I have been wrapping myself up in the response, in the confusion, in the trouble, and I want to start wrapping myself in God's presence. I want to keep on praying. I need that strength. With every head bowed and eye closed in this place, just out of respect for your neighbor, would you raise your hand? That is me. I have that. I, I, want, I want to be wrapped up in the strength of God. I'm not going to stop choosing on wrapping myself up in problems. Yeah, I see those hands. Absolutely. I see your hands. God sees you right where you're at. You can put your hand down. If you were here tonight and you would say, well, you know, I, I, I don't think... Pastor Luke, that I've ever really like given my life to Jesus. Like I've never really prayed to him. I've never, maybe out of a desperation and confusion, but I've never given my life to him. I'm, I, I want to be a child of God. I want to I wanna, I wanna accept that sacrifice of his son. And I want that constant peace and strength. If that's you in this place and you you want to give your life to Jesus, would you just raise your hand? Nobody looking around. See, that's me. I want that. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. I see your hand. Absolutely. I'm just going to pray over us and we're just going to worship. And we're going to wrap ourselves up in, in, in the strength of Jesus, the faithfulness of Jesus. God, we thank you that you're with us. We thank you for the promises. We thank you that we can trust your heart, that you're so good. Even when we don't see things happening, things moving, we can trust you. Help us to lean into you. God, it's not an emotional thing that once we feel good, we'll choose you. But God, it is truly a choice. Whether No matter what we feel like in the moment, we come to you in your presence in prayer. We come to you. We wait on you, God. We wrap ourselves up in you. We thank you for new strength.
I'll just leave that as kind of our ending. We're just going to end in some, in some time of worship. There won't be an official dismissal, per se. Maybe Pastor Jeff will come up. But I challenge you just to find a sp- space, find a place, find a friend. We love you, and God's strength is going to just renew you and fill you up tonight. Amen.